Hello, I'm Jim Vrecchia, Director of Atlanta Master Corral's business side of the organization, and I welcome you to our Spirited Conversations Behind the Scores program. We are continuing that spirit of our organization's mission to inspire and enrich the lives of our community. As you well know, today's guest is very respected and uh, almost a household name in any Coral World's homes. Uh, he's a composer, conductor, educator, clinician, Dan Forrest. So let's get to this conversation. Uh, I'm welcoming Eric Nelson now, who's our Corral's artistic director, and he will open our program and bring Dan into the conversation. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome to this conversation and welcome to Dan Forrest. Dan is one of the most uh, prolific and loved uh, choral composers living and working today. Uh, I joked uh, just before coming on to this call that uh, it, it, Dan has written hundreds of pieces and I think I've performed at least half of them. Uh, every piece that he writes is a gem and beautiful. Some of his works are a cappella. Some of them are uh, gentle short pieces with piano, some extended works with piano and percussion, and some major works with orchestra. Um, all of them are wonderful, and we're going to talk with him today about uh, how he became who he is and kind of what maybe what's on the horizon. We're also going to specifically talk about one work that he wrote for Atlanta Master Chorale that was a commission from Atlanta Master Chorale to Dan, and it's just one of our favorite pieces. And we're going to be singing this piece again in our concert coming up in a couple of weeks, our return to the stage. So with that, hi, Dan. Hey there. Hi, Eric. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. I'm talking with you from my office uh, in Atlanta uh, on the campus of Emory University. Where are you today? This is my studio behind me at home where I try to make magic happen and some days maybe succeed. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, I, do you write every day since you mentioned that you're sitting there? Do, do, are you one of those composers who has a schedule like Schubert? Uh, not. I'm somewhere in between. Um, when the ideas are flowing, then I write a lot. When the ideas are not flowing, I try not to force bad ideas. So sometimes it's an hour of sorting through and making decisions that I don't have anything worthwhile, but that's my hour of work that day. So. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it is a, a remarkable thing. I've, I've written a couple of pieces myself, and it's, it's um, I suppose it's like starting a novel in a way. Uh, that there's that moment when you are looking at a blank piece of manuscript paper, either on a computer or on a piano rack, and uh, the piece doesn't exist yet. And getting from that uh, idea, maybe it's a commission, maybe it's a poem, maybe it's something that from your own self that you have, kind of have an idea about, um, getting from that where there's nothing, uh, that act of creation, for there, there isn't anything. And then in the end, there is this thing that you send out into the world and people like me uh, program it and it takes on a life of its own. It's got to be, um, it's an interesting way to make a living, isn't it? Yeah, there's those memes that go around social media that say, describe your job badly. And I often use something like, I dream up sounds, then use, use black blobs on white paper so that other people can recreate them. <laughs> or something like that and um it's when people ask what i do i think oh boy here comes that conversation you know yeah it, it does feel like you're creating something out of nothing and it can be terrifying staring yeah. at a blank page blank screen so i usually don't sit down to try to write anything down until i've mentally come up with something worth jotting you know so there's a lot of work that's just when i'm laying in bed or when i'm driving and not doing anything else or just mulling ideas over and looking for that point of inspiration that's, that's worth committing to, yeah. Well, before we talk about um, this wonderful piece that you wrote for Atlanta Master Corral uh, on the E.E. E. Cummings text, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day. Before we get to that, and we're going to listen to it uh, before long, I want to start with a question that I, I tend to ask our guests at these spirited conversations. And that can be boiled down to how did you become you? Um, I'm assuming that you were found as a, as a child or a youth as someone with musical talent. I know you're a pianist, so I assume that you had piano lessons and were you a piano major in college maybe even? Um, and then um, there's a lot of 
th th that vein is in common with a lot of people, right? A lot of people have a version of that story, right? Uh, I, I, I had some talent, I like music, I took piano lessons, uh, but they don't become Dan Forrest. So um, how, did you, how, did, how did you kind of get to where you are now? When did you start composing? How did music find you? I think you already summed it up. I don't, and I don't know what made me any different from anybody else on that path. <laughs> yes to everything you said. Um, it was just there early for me. One of my earliest musical memories is my parents watching Masterpiece Theater on Sunday night. And I would be put to bed before that. And um, I, I needed to stay in bed or else I'd get in trouble, you know, and my door was shut. But I could hear that Moray Rondo. <laughs> And that just set my mind on fire. And I had to hear that music. So like upon pain of punishment, <laughs> when that came on, I would sneak out of bed because I knew my parents were going to watch that on Sunday night and crack the door open, like put my ear up to it. It's just for a rare chance to hear that music. And of course, this is like the really early 80s. So it's not like you have iTunes or easy access to a lot of things. So you kind of had to go where the music was. And as a kid, I had to just go where I could find it. So yeah, I mean, I was I was kind of risking life and limb, <laughs> getting out of bed to hear a little bit of early early Baroque music there. Um, isn't, isn't that amazing? How for you it was such an important thing, and yet how many youths across America heard the same thing and barely noticed? I, just, I don't I don't fully understand that. It's I I I've responded to music in the same way when I was a kid. Yeah, I I attribute that to maybe just some a sense of calling, honestly. Um, and it just, it, it kind of sent me into orbit and I just had to be where that was. So yeah, fourth grade, I started piano. Um, I was ding doodling around at the piano a lot before that, but that's where formal lessons started for me. Um, just kind of burned through all the piano lesson books really fast. And uh, by 10th grade, I got to play the Greek piano concerto with the, our local symphony in our big concert hall in our little town. Um, really neat opportunities. I had some great teachers um, that I purposely list in my bio because I'll always be indebted to what they invested in me. I had teachers beyond what I should have had for the, for the small rural part of New York that I grew up in. Um, so thankful for that. Ended up doing a piano undergrad and a piano master's as well, both in performance. Um, but somewhere towards the end of my master's degree, I was just so tired of piano and pianizing and the piano shacks and the piano culture and also listening to notes that when I pressed them down, just died. <laughs> Garrick Olson's famous quote is that the piano is a box of decrescendos. It's truer words have never been spoken. I love that quote. And we're always trying to cover that fact up and, and act like it's capable of more than it actually is. And there are, there are cool ways to do that, certainly. But um, at the same time in college, I was hearing really fine choirs for the first time and listening to the beauty of the human voice. And that was actually much more compelling to me than what I was doing my master's degree <laughs> at the piano. So somewhere along the way, I had started improvising a lot at the piano. Um, even in, in middle school, I was playing notes that weren't on the page, which I would consider the earliest hints of me composing, you know, coming up with my own notes. And then eventually I just came up with my own notes that were worth writing down and less and less related to what had been previously given to me on the page and it just sort of morphed into okay I have my own ideas so I'm sort of arranging and some of my arranging ideas kind of stand on their own so that's composing and then eventually some of those composing ideas were worth writing down and submitting to a publisher and then sooner or later a few of them got accepted and it just kind of morphed into something there's there was no you know people sometimes ask when did you know you wanted to be a composer mm -hmm. <laughs> i never had that epiphany moment it was it was just i wanted to make music and i kept doing whatever i could and it, it just kind of morphed into that so today even for you to give me that very very kind maybe overstated <laughs> introduction uh, i'm still just surprised and really thankful that uh, people in the choral world know me and, and want to recreate the sounds I dreamed of. Yeah. Nice. Is there an aspect of, um, you could have, um, you, you half answered this already in saying that you were exposed to fine choirs and that that was speaking to you, fill, filling your soul, you were responding to that in a way that was um, different even than the, the, the piano works you were doing at a high level for your master's degree. Um, so that's half of the answer, but you could have also composed for, you know, sonatas for violin and piano and all that sort of thing, right? Um, you, you were still, it seems to me, drawn towards choral music in particular. 
So was it just the sound of the human voice or was it something about, you know, the words that you get to say? Yeah, again, you, both of your answers are correct there. I have written all those other things. I mean, my doctorate is in composition in general, and I had to cover a wide variety of things to earn that degree. Um, and I studied with a guy who, who was a band composer and doesn't write choral music at all, hmm. um, which was actually really good for me, kind of balancing things out. So I wasn't just kind of a one trick pony or something. Um, and I, I owe him a lot for like those major works with chorus and orchestra, where I feel like I know my way around the orchestra in addition to the choir. Um, but yeah, for me, the, the choir is the kind of the pinnacle of all that music making. It's the most satisfying to me out of, I've written pieces for wind band. I have written a sonata for, for piano and violin, <laughs> like you mentioned. I don't know if you knew that, but um, yeah, there's, there's various instrumental things and ensemble pieces, but it's the sound of the voice. I feel like that's the, the purest and highest, and there's a spirituality inherent in the instrument because it's not that you hold this instrument in your hands, you are the instrument. And the, the very uh, breath, the, the vibrating air column that creates your musical tone is what also keeps you alive at the same time. It's, it's the breath of life and the, the breath stream that's creating music. Those two are just inextricably woven together in this mysterious and beautiful way. And then you add the ability to actually say something. And I mean, all music says something. Mm -hmm. and, John Cage famously said, I have nothing to say and I'm saying it. <laughs> I do have things to say and I want to say them. And there are ways that I can say them um, just instrumentally for, with, with a work for violin and piano or for wind band or something. Um, but the way that the combination of text and music adds up to more than the sum of the parts is what pulls me in. I can take a text that might be worth a value of 10 on some scale and set it to music that might be worth a value of eight on some scale and then when you add all that together and hear a performance, somehow the total is not 18, it's like 26. You know, like, where did those extra eight come from? That, that mystery is what draws me back to choral music, that extra eight. Like, I don't know how that happened, but I want to hear it again and again and again. And I want to write the next piece that might create more than the sum of the parts and it just keeps going. Well, and, and may I say as well that, that one of the things Another of the things that I appreciate about you as a composer is you have a really great sense of how to, how to find and how to set great poetry. Mm. Um, some of the pieces you've done have been set by many composers, and I'm just happy to hear your take on it. Uh, but you also find things, uh, poems that are just beautiful, and I've never heard them before. And um, I'm glad that I find them. Uh, I was telling my, my school choir the other day that um, I have a love of poetry and a knowledge of poetry. I can recite poems um, that I didn't learn because of poetry class. I learned them because of, of I, I, I sang them at one point or conducted them at one point, and then they exist in my mind, not only as that piece of music, uh, but also the poem by itself continues to be, uh, I, I own that too. So another compliment to you. I just, I love um the text that you choose to set. My mom is a, well, she's retired now, but she was an English teacher <laughs> and she was my English teacher. So there might be some, some family connection to a love of literary beauty that way too. Before we listen to, I thank you God for most this amazing day and start uh, talking about that piece in particular that you wrote for us. Um, I want to kind of finish up the bio part of this. Um, so after you submitted a couple pieces to publishers and you started um, doing this uh, as part of your life. Um, if I remember correctly, you, you were teaching on a college faculty for a bit mm -hmm. um, and then kind of threw all that over to just be a composer full time. Uh, and I know you have an editing life uh, also with publishing. So um, give, give us the, the, the summary of how, how one went to the other there as well. Because as I say, I, I do a little bit of composing myself, but um, leaving my day job to just compose uh, is something that uh, must have been a huge step. It seems like it would have been a huge step for you. Yeah. So to be fair, you keep saying that you've written a couple pieces, but you've written a lot more than that and some really beautiful works that I love and lots of other people love too. So let's just be clear about that. Um, yeah. When I was teaching, I felt like I was sort of at 80% of my, my full potential at both teaching and composing. And I loved both of them and wanted to keep doing both of them. But year by year, it became more and more 
clear that I just couldn't do both to my fullest potential and I needed to pick one and minimize the other. Um, so through a long set of circumstances um, and eventually a job offer from Beckenhorst Press, um, I decided that I was just gonna go all in on the, the composer thing. I felt like I might have a more unique voice and something special to offer there than I would necessarily as an educator. So I still love both of those things. I love education, but I, I'm kind of spoiled in that I show up and do the guest artist, guest speaker kind of thing. And then I go home after hopefully inspiring people and I don't grade papers or go to committee meetings. <laughs> so it's, it's almost shameful because I, I get some of the privileges without the, the need for responsibilities that other people have to bear. But yeah, that just became clear. So it was May of 2012 that I um, stopped teaching, stepped down from my post. Um, I did that on a Saturday and on Monday, two days later, I began writing my Requiem. And I, I really think I could not have written that piece, which is probably my most widely known piece. I couldn't have written it if I hadn't cleared out that bandwidth and just made room to just immerse myself and, and try to climb that mountain, you know? So I, I, I feel like it's paid off and I, I'm glad I made that choice, even though it wasn't easy. Nice. So um, I thank you, God, for most of this amazing day. We did a concert a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, I often will do Master Girl concerts that are um, set up by a theme. And the title of this concert was called Making Sense. And I love um, common, common terms like that, that everybody knows and everybody uses. And then when they actually come to the concert, they find out that it's not, make, it's not delivering an argument that is coherent, but in fact, the concert was all uh, music related to the five senses, mm -hmm. um, seeing and smelling and tasting and touching. And it was, um, so every piece on the program was related to that. As part of that, I wanted to commission you to write us a piece. And I, as I remember the story, I called you and asked you to accept a commission from us and specifically asked you to do a setting of this E.E. E. Cummings poem. There's the moment in the middle of the poem that is kind of a statement of faith. How can tasting, touching, seeing, hearing, um, how can just a, a mere human being doubt the existence of, as he puts it, unimaginable you directing to God, uh, his, his poem to God directly. And this idea of all the senses being wrapped up in the middle of this poem just struck me as being really compelling. And we talked a little bit about the fact that good composers have written good settings of this and did the world need another one? Yes. And uh, I said, yes, please. Uh, we need your take on this. And um, you, you accepted. And I don't remember. And so the piece as we're about to hear is, is for choir and piano, but also string quintet, um, two violins, viola, cello, and a string bass, and a percussionist who actually you can't see in the video because he's behind the sopranos and just happens to be blocked <laughs> by them. I have people occasionally saying, you know, where did you put the timpani? I can't see him. And he's, he's right there. He can see me. I can see her. And you see him. Um, but I don't remember whether I specifically asked you to do it for choir and, and assorted instruments or whether I just gave you latitude to do that and that's what you chose. You may not remember either yourself at this point, um, but is that kind of how you remember it from your side too? Yeah, mostly. My only recollection is that you might be underselling my reluctance about that particular text. <laughs> I, was, I was like, are you sure you really, I mean, you know, there's some really fine settings out there and does the world really need it? That probably was my exact line. Does the world really need another one? I wasn't sure that I, I wanted to try to uh, compete in a sense or, you know, try to add something. Is there something new to really be said with that text or has, has what needs to be said, at least in our generation, already been said? Um, but you were pretty certain that it, you you kind of lobbied me like, no, I want to hear your voice on this text, um, which was an encouragement to me. I, I felt honored that you wanted, you felt like I would probably have something to say. I still wasn't positive I did, <laughs> but it, it made me think that maybe it was worth a shot. My, my moment of inspiration for this piece, I remember vividly, we go down to Edison Island every summer. I don't know if I've told you this story. <laughs> um, Every summer, our family goes down there for a week. It's very laid back and secluded and non-commercial. And um, 
there's a bike ride that I often take there that goes back across kind of the marshes and back onto the mainland. And I, I ride around there for a while and then come back. And uh, this was my number one piece. And I was in that looking for an idea stage that I talked about, like not, not going to sit down and try to write anything. I'm just looking for a way in. I, I got to find a, a point of inspiration where some light starts shining and I feel a little bit of interest and excitement and maybe there's something that this can turn into. So I was going for that ride and uh, mulling over this text about the, the beauty of this earth and everything around us, this amazing day. And it was the most gorgeous day. And I'm down at the beach, it's the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm riding my bike across this narrow bridge that goes across the marsh to get back to the mainland. And the wind is just pushing through all the reeds on the marshes and the, the sun is shining and it's just the most beautiful thing. And then out of nowhere, this beautiful egret <laughs> rises up out of the marsh, this white bird, huge wingspan, just pure snow white, and just rises up effortlessly and just starts floating across this sea of marsh grass blowing in the wind. And I thought, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, like this moment of this day. Th look at that. It was, I just had this moment um, seeing the kind of beauty that E.E. E. Cummings was talking about in that text. And it was very shortly after that, that um, something about maybe just the, the vast marshes and the, how it's just grass as far as you can see may have lent itself to that kind of minimalist. Just a, a very simple idea, like one blade of grass, but just repeated as far as the eye could see. Mm -hmm. And yet constantly changing and moving in the wind and morphing into new things. And then this bird just rising and floating over the top of all of it is okay. almost like the choir rising and floating over top of all this grass underneath. So I don't know if I've painted the picture well enough for you, but it was a really beautiful moment. And I see it when I hear this music still. You had not told me that story. And that, that makes all the sense in the world. That is exactly what it feels like. And um, after we listen to it, I'm going to talk a little bit more with you about the duality of that single read, as you put it, that melodic uh, pattern that repeats um, with, with subtle variations all, all piece long. And then the, the, the long phrases, the long expanse of how long it takes the choir um, yeah. to reclaim the text. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's unusual, I think, in, in core rep. And I think unusual, I think it's unusual even with the pieces that you write. Um, and and uh, certainly there's repeated melodic cells and there's long phrases, but um, this one feels um, special and unusual. So um, I, I, the, to our listening audience, uh, the piece is not real quick. This is not one of those two, three minute pieces. It takes a little time to listen to, but uh, in the same way that you wouldn't want to have, uh, have foreshortened that ride, um, we, we need to experience the piece from beginning to end and, and feel how it evolves uh, and rises and, and settles. So um, let's give a listen to the entirety of our performance. Uh, this was the premiere performance uh, of I Thank You God for Most This Amazing Day, then we'll talk about it on the other side.
Beautiful piece, Dan. What do you what do you think and feel as you experience that piece again? Uh, 100% honesty. I haven't actually listened all the way through in real time like that for probably a couple years. And I think, did that actually come from me? <laughs> That's so beautiful. I love your rendition of it. And I'm, I'm thrilled with that piece. Wow. I'd, I'd like to, I don't know that I've heard it live, actually. I would love to. Sometimes, my goodness, you invited me down for the premiere, and I, I think I had something going on and hated that I couldn't make it. But we're, we're doing it again in a couple of weeks, so we'll talk when this when this call is over. All right, um, yeah, I need to hear it. My goodness. It, so it's um, I, I should say too, the piece was uh, dedicated to Tony Myers. Tony Myers, who is uh, a friend of ours, was a, a board chair for the organization. It's interesting that you. That that the the long expanse of the melody is is an egret flying in your in your imagination, and uh, Tony uh, allowed our organization to to fly in in a way that it hadn't before. So, um, a wonderful a, appropriate image uh, for her. Uh, I, I am struck still every time I I do the piece um, th with the brevity of that opening gesture that. Then repeats with variations the entire piece long. And so even for those that are on the call that are not necessarily musicians, uh, that's three beats, one and two and three, just three beats long, repeating over and over again. And, and so there's that melodic cell, as we might call it, that, that, that motive, that rhythmic fragment that, that repeats over and over. But the actual first phrase of text, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day. Um, it strikes me it, that the logical thing to do, the, the common thing to do is you have a, a bit of a melody that's used as an introduction, and then that melody is used with words as the choir comes in. Um, you know, thank you, most this amazing, you know, something <laughs> uh, could have been done to, to the, that would have been the melody. Uh, but in fact, the choir never sings that motive. And when, when we actually say all the words to, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, I check, because the score is sitting right here next to me. That takes 16 measures. <laughs> yeah. You've done once. So three beats times 16 measures is, is 48 beats. So you have this contrast between the motive that's three beats long, and then this, this first phrase that takes 48 beats to happen, and then the whole rest of the piece long until we get to how can tasting, touching, the, which, which then is compacted again. Almost everything in the piece is that, that long breathed. Um, and you've talked about the, the image from the, from the bike ride, and maybe that's all there is to the story, but um, it's an unusual choice, Dan, and brilliant. And so um, I remember you sent me an email at one point saying that you had an idea for something that was almost minimalistic. And I suspect yeah. that's what you had in mind um, as it was beginning to brew. So um, I think there's a question in there. How did this contrast kind of happen? And, and when did you feel like this is, this is the piece? This is, this is, how did you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop talking. Um, it, it strikes me as being uh, that it took a lot of confidence um, in yourself to repeat a motive that many times over eight minutes and not think it's going to get deadly dull and to trust that the audience would be able to hear a phrase that takes that long to emerge before you get to the last word. And also that's going to work. Um, th yeah, so I'll stop. Uh, talk a little bit more about this thing. Yeah, my answer may be as, as sprawling as your question. I don't, um, there are several factors in play. One is um, I love playing with time in music and the, the difference between clock time and perceived time. Mm -hmm. some, of, some of my pieces that last the longest feel so short because not much happens, but it's because time just sort of slows down as the piece evolves and you sort of adapt to a, a new time scale almost. 
I don't know whether like the, the beating of our hearts slows down or just our perception just feels like we've entered sort of a different dimension, but we've all experienced that mm-hmm. where time just either, either flies by or sort of stops or something, you know, I think music, it, it, music is, is unfolding through time instead of space. Um, the way that visual art is, and it, it messes with that time. And I love playing with that. Some of my favorite musical moments involve that sense of time being suspended or just disappearing or something like that. Um, I love the way that um, voices can stretch out, and especially uh, singers with trained breath support like yours <laughs> can stretch out a, a line like that for that long. And I love taking advantage of that. I also have always been fascinated with um, box chorale preludes, if I can go a little theory geeky here, um, in terms of how they take some new material and then use that new material to bear on its own shoulders some pre-existing material. So if we say, yay, zu joy of man's desiring, we all think. But that's actually just counter material. That's box. That's his version of that. What's actually gonna be born on the shoulders of that is which would have been a hymn tune that lots of people knew. So whether I'm arranging hymns or whether I'm setting existing poetry like this in a completely new setting, I'm often looking for some other material that surprise bears on its shoulders the, the actual melodic weight, whether that's a hymn tune or in this case, just this beautiful Cummings text. The last thing is the word amazing in this text. Um, I was trying to find a way that this, when we finished, we just felt like this piece communicated that to us, that we just felt bowled over by the wonder of this day, you know. And so I think all of these elements combining are me trying to leave the listener with that sense of wonder and amazement. Um, and, and something about the way they all come together sort of made me feel that way. And then I hoped would help the audience feel the same way. It's um, just exquisitely successful. Um, one of the other things that I, f- I find interesting about it is that in repeating this tune in its, in its subtle variations, it, it has traditional harmony in it, right? Mm-hmm. This, this, what you would expect of, of chords going where, where you ex- want them to go. But they they are superimposed um, in this unexpected way over top of that tune. And you get occasionally C major, which you might expect given that, but also A minor, G, D minor, and then back to C. Arguably, the other tonic of the piece, which is F major, which is actually how the piece ends. Well, the piece ends. But the last chord we heard was. The last chord is that, and yeah. so I think I think that 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 knowledge that that you could keep the motive going, and then vary the harmony put on it. Um, and then decide your time scale. Um, and then occasionally there's some kind of clusters that are in the vo- voice part as they kind of um, in horizontally line up, mm-hmm. like vertically line up for yeah. a while. Um, all, all of that, um, for me, add to this sense of, of, of expanse. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an earworm, gotta tell ya. Um, <laughs> You know, once you listen to this for a while or rehearse it for an evening, it's a little hard to go to sleep at night because uh, it keeps cycling back upon itself, right? Yeah. I remember um, one thing that I asked you about was the one measure, the one beat measure of rest. Do you remember that? I do. I, 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 I was going to bring it up if you didn't because it's one of my yes. favorite parts of the entire piece. I was going to joke and say that's one of the best measures I've ever written. <laughs> it, it's so weird. I, so for listeners, it, the it's uh, in the first section. So that's which is infinite, and then here comes which is, and then there's this one four bar in here. It's just it's its own measure. 
because it, it felt like a downbeat. It didn't feel like just another beat before a new downbeat. It felt like, which is nothing. Yes. And it sets up the word yes. And yes comes after it. It felt so right to me. And I resisted it for so long. <laughs> Kept trying to change it, find a different way to do it. Finally, I was like, this is what this wants. So I think I sent it to you and said, like, are you OK with this? Because I and, and I think you wrote back overwhelmingly positively. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a brilliant moment. And, and, and rhetorically, it makes sense. Right? Don't we often pause just before the main point we're going to make to make sure that every, we got everybody's attention? Um, you know, this, this thing I'm about to say is really important. I'm going to say this. And right, you just kind of everybody snaps to the silence. And I do think that if, if, if the audience's ear is attention is left for that, that moment, the silence snaps everybody back to wait, what? And then just, yeah, it's just brilliant. If I had not put that rest in, then the, the text says, um, for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. Yeah. And it just seems to understate it too much, uh, it, which is yes. What does that even mean? Yeah. But to say everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes, that it, it communicated so much better for me. And if I remember correctly, I'll turn the page. I think that's one of the moments you landed on C major. Mm -hmm. Yes. Finally. Well, a version of C major, right? Yep. Yeah, so there's, I mean, what, what could be more primal, um, right, than a, a C major chord uh, tied to yes, right? It, it's it's uh, just archetypically, um, you know, Strauss also struck Zarathustra, that moment, you know, C, <laughs> C major is just so incredibly primal. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just fantastic. I. You, you said humbly, you, you, you're a little surprised that you wrote the piece when you hear it back. And, and um, I, I, I get that feeling. There, there is sometimes a joy from listening to, to the muse, following, following your gifts um, that results in the existence of this piece. And I do think sometimes, you must think about it a lot, that if I had not called you, if I had not talked you into writing this piece, it would not exist. Yeah. And, and how much less, you know, we would have been robbed of that experience. Um, and, and there's no given that you would have just done it one Sunday afternoon on your own. Um, um, and, and so there is that, I'm, I'm sure that there are other, other writers who received commissions and write pieces that they're especially fond of, that are especially successful, that they're glad with, were birthed into the, into the world. Um, but there, there is a little sense of this, I don't quite know where this came from, um, right? Yeah, it feels, people often say like, what is it like listening to your music? And um, they, they probably presume that I hear a piece of mine and, and just lovingly look at every note as if it were my baby, you know? <laughs> or here's all my little children doing exactly what I told them to do. But I've written so many pieces since then. And as soon as I finish one piece, I'm always on to the next one. I don't really get to sit on my laurels at that moment. But so when I come back to a piece like this, it just feels like this piece is right. It set up its own little world. It ab abided by the terms of its own little world. It did what it needed to do. It feels organic and inevitable and all those words that we throw around, just trying to describe something that just feels right. You know, it feels like each note is where it should be. And I'm just so glad it's there. And then like after that, there's this little moment like, oh, I'm the one that put that note there. <laughs> So yes. it seems less about like whether I chose that particular note or not and more just like this piece needed to be. And, and now here it is and I'm so thankful that it's here. And then it, it adds another layer to think if I was the one that got to help bring it to life because it needed to be. I'm just really thankful for that. Those kinds of opportunities that happen over and over. It's, it sounds to me like you're almost describing the, 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 a sense of, of archeology, span a sense of uncovering um, that the composition process is not just telling the notes what to do, although certainly that's, that's what's happening, but there's also a sense of, as, 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 as it's being written, that it wants to go a certain way. And right, don't you kind of feel like on, on some level you're, you're serving that, you're trying to discover how it goes. It goes a certain way and you're the one who gets to discover it, but it already half exists. That's a little hooey wooey, I will grant you, but um, isn't, that, isn't that partly what you're describing here? <laughs> Whatever hooey wooey means, yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I have both studied with Alice Parker, and um, you've done some Alice work, haven't you? Uh, um, I'm not one-on-one, not -on -one, no. 
Oh, but she, you've hosted her at Emory. Or, oh, of course, or something. Yeah. 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 And she was, I, I, she's the one that I first heard say, ask the line where it wants to go. Ah. And that's kind of a hooey wooey statement. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it sounds right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot less about me saying, well, I want this to happen and more about like, here are the tiny little processes that I already set in motion. Now, where can they go? And there are certain places where they could go that would be predictable and we'd be disappointed that, the, that they went where we hoped. <laughs> but then there are places that they go where you can be thrilled that they went where you hoped. And then there are times that they can go someplace you completely didn't expect that outdoes your expectations. And right. that's really under the microscope. But right. uh, if you could put the microscope on any like one beat <laughs> or one note of this piece, I would hope that at that moment, your expectations were either fulfilled satisfyingly or outdone rather than like, oh, I was afraid that was what was going to come or even worse, like, oh, where did that come from? You know, right. so it, it's a lot more about like, I've set these tiny little processes in motion, but once they get rolling, you just have to pay attention to them and listen to where the line wants to go and what the piece is trying to do. And that kind of sensitivity, I think, results in the pieces that I'm more proud of because they feel right. Jim, I don't know. Occasionally, we have folks that are on the call who um, will ask them questions. I don't know whether we have any or not today. If not, maybe you have one uh, yourself. And so I'll, I'll pause for a moment to see if there's anything. Uh, and if, if there is, uh, we'll be glad to take them. If there isn't, then I will um, wrap this up here. I, I thank you. I, I, I'm not going to come on screen just yet. There are two things. Well, first off, I want to say that um, I think that piece, Dan, um, shows us the depth of your soul. Somehow I was thinking about that as I listened to it, as I heard the conversation, you're talking about all this piece. It really gives us a, a picture uh, of you as a, a, the soul of your being. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for that. Um, a mm -hmm. question that I might have is, as we often get periodically from people when we have composers on these things, um, what would you say or what advice would you give or some practical points for aspiring composers? Mm. I throw that to you. Yeah, that's, that question comes up a lot. It's, yeah. I think it's so <laughs> difficult to answer. Um, what, the best answer I know for that is in the, the concise version, don't separate all the, the musical opportunities that you may have at the moment that may not seem as directly related to composing don't think that those are unrelated and that you're looking for some like door that you could open that actually leads to being a composer. Like we sort of hinted at that in my path, at least. I, I may be projecting a little bit, but in my path, it was not like one blinding moment on the Damascus road, you know, <laughs> the light shone and suddenly now I know what I want to do. It was more just seizing the opportunities that were there and finding what my place was in the music making process. And eventually that place becomes clear and composers need conductors and conductors need performers and we all have our role to play. And the more you just pursue whatever opportunities or gifts you have um, in, in that music making process, the more you find yourself, I think, settling into the place where you most belong. And that may be composing, great. But if so, you'll be a richer composer for having sought all those other opportunities, whether that's you know, studying conducting or learning an instrument or developing your vocal skills or knowing your music history or your music theory for students in classes. Um, I just would say seize every opportunity you can to develop your musicianship because the best composers are really the best musicians. I'm pulling all that just together. Just came in a, a, a question from Andrew Bolden, my friend and former student asks whether it's different singing, I thank you God for most this amazing day in Master Corral this time around um, as we're coming out of the pandemic as opposed to doing it in the before times. Um, and he references that you said something in, a, in another one of these uh, a podcasts somewhere else talking about how maybe after the pandemic, choral music would even be richer and deeper experience. And, you know, are we finding that to be, to be true? I can say, Andrew, that in thinking about what it was going to be like to step onto the stage and sing a concert, which we're about to do in a couple of weeks, that um, the word amazing kept coming up. Right, and just in conversation, we were saying, you know, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be an amazing day. I can't wait for this to happen. I'm so thankful that this amazing day is gonna happen. So it wasn't a big step for me to realize that um, this piece needed to be done on that concert. And that this was, you know, the perfect piece to do. 
And there is a sense of uh, an exhale. There is a sense to use your earlier analogy of looking out across a vista um, of possibilities, um, of breathing the air again, though we still have masks on for this performance, but uh, we're, we're still getting closer to, to, to kind of, um, we're not quite there yet, but this that sense of, of the privilege and the joy, the, the genuine amazingness of getting to make music together. Um, so there is absolutely a, a sense of, um, uh, we never really took it for granted anyway. It's one of the things I love about Atlanta Master Chorale. We, we, we are very grateful for the chance, every chance that we have to make music together. Um, but it does feel different, I think, um, in, in, a, in, in a, a richer way. It's just been such a long time. It's been such a drought, right? It's a, it's a, it's a drink of cool water after a walk through the desert. Um, for us. Yeah. Dan, are you experiencing right music? You're starting to get music sung again and played again, right? A, a bit. Yeah. It feels like we're beginning the long road right. back. Yeah. Um, it feels like we still have quite a ways to go, but the, the few uh, opportunities I've had thus far have indeed been richer and more meaningful and people are more deeply invested in the music making process, I think, than they were before. Uh, both musically and, and emotionally. It feels like it really matters. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your process and your journey. Thank you for the wonderful music that you have already written. Um, if you never wrote another note, uh, we have this tremendously rich, um, just important body of work that enriches the lives of all who sing them and uh, you are not done. And so I'm excited about all the pieces uh, yet to come that um, you haven't imagined yet yourself. And I look forward to uh, adding those to the repertoire of yours that I get to conduct and learn and perform and put out into the world. Um, thank you, we appreciate you and are very grateful for you. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to hang on to that as I go try to write my next piece. <laughs> and it's always an honor to be with you. We've gotten to our paths have crossed several times, but I'm always glad when they do. And I hope they continue to. Thank you for, for bringing my music to life so beautifully. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Eric. Wow. That's all I can say about this whole program. It was phenomenal. Um, it was great to have you with us. And hopefully we'll get to uh, sing that piece for you live one of these days. Complete details for our upcoming season, and uh, we have a new uh, venture with live streaming our concerts for those of you out of state and out of town. Uh, all that's on our website, atlantamasterchorale.org forward slash concerts. Uh, we hope you'll join us. It has been wonderful today, and have a great, great week. <laughs>